Hello and welcome, I'm Fernando, a GP in the UK. Today we will go through the new guideline on diagnosing, monitoring and managing chronic asthma, focusing on what is relevant in primary care only. Given how extensive the guidance is, in this episode we'll just focus on asthma monitoring, general treatment principles and management in special groups. If you haven't already, I recommend checking out the previous three episodes on this subject, covering initial assessment and diagnosis, asthma treatment in patients aged 12 and over, and asthma treatment in children aged 5 to 11 and those under 5. Right, let's jump into it. As you know, the new guideline is a joint initiative by NICE, the British Thoracic Society, or BTS, and the Scottish Intercollegiate Guidelines Network, or SIGN. It replaces previous guidance, and you'll find a link to it in the episode description. And in terms of monitoring asthma control, we will review symptoms, including daytime, nighttime, and limitation of activities, significant events, such as the number of asthma attacks, any admissions to hospital, attendance at an emergency department due to asthma, and time of work or school due to asthma, medication use, including possible side effects, the amount of reliever inhaler used, including a check of the prescription record, and the number of courses of oral corticosteroids. And we will finally review the lung function, normally FEV1 or peak flow reading. Complete control of asthma is defined as no daytime symptoms, no nighttime awakening due to asthma, no asthma attacks, no need for rescue medication, no limitations on activity including exercise, normal lung function in practical terms FEV1 and or peak flow more than 80% predicted or best, and minimal side effects from treatment. On the other hand, uncontrolled asthma can be defined as one or both of the following. Any asthma exacerbation needing treatment with oral corticosteroids. And frequent regular symptoms such as needing a reliever inhaler three or more days per week or having one or more nights per week when asthma causes nighttime waking. If control is suboptimal, we will look at the recommendations on pharmacological treatment, which we have covered separately in episodes 2 and 3. A significant change is that we will not use regular peak flow monitoring to assess asthma control unless there are person-specific reasons for doing so, for example, when peak flow measurement is part of the personalized asthma action plan. Instead, we will consider using a validated symptom questionnaire at any asthma review. Examples are the asthma control questionnaire and the asthma control test, including its pediatric version. In addition, for adults, we will consider fractional exhaled nitric oxide or phenomonitoring, other regular review, and before and after changing the asthma therapy. Let's remember that a high phenol level indicates airway inflammation. Therefore, in terms of asthma control, a high phenol level means that there is ongoing inflammation in the airways, which can lead to asthma symptoms, the higher risk of asthma exacerbations. And phenol testing can also help determine how well inhaled corticosteroids are working. If phenol levels remain high despite treatment, it may indicate that the current treatment needs to be increased. Now that we have looked at the monitoring of asthma, let's now look at some general principles of treatment. And first of all, we need to remember the new golden rule. And the main development is the end of what we used to call step one treatment, that is, when intermittent short acting bronchodilators were used alone on a PRM basis. From now on, the golden rule is clear. No prescribing short-acting beta-2 agonists or SABAs for asthma at any age without an inhaled corticosteroid. Next, we need to be aware that the licensed indications of inhalers vary depending on the type of drug, the dose given and the different devices. Not all asthma inhalers are licensed for every recommendation, so we should refer to the summary of product characteristics of each individual product. 
Also, before starting or adjusting the treatment, we should consider possible reasons for uncontrolled asthma. These may include alternative diagnoses or comorbidities, suboptimal adherence or inhaler technique, smoking, both active or passive, including vaping and the use of e-cigarettes, occupational exposures, psychosocial factors, for example, anxiety and depression. And finally, we should also consider seasonal and environmental factors, for example, air pollution and indoor mold exposure. If possible, we will check the fractional exhaled nitric oxide or phenol level when asthma is uncontrolled. If it is raised, this may indicate poor adherence to treatment or the need for an increased dose of inhaled corticosteroid. After starting or adjusting the asthma treatment, we will review the response after 8 to 12 weeks before considering further changes. We will base the choice of inhaler on an assessment of correct technique, remembering to check it at every asthma-related consultation on the patient's preference, the lowest environmental impact on unsuitable devices, the presence of an integral dose counter, and a spacer should usually be prescribed for use with a metered dose inhaler, particularly in children. If possible, we will prescribe the same type of device to deliver preventer and reliever treatments. In addition, when prescribing dry powder inhalers, we will consider providing an additional metered dose short-acting beta-2 agonist or SABA with a spacer for an emergency use for children under 12 years who may be unable to activate a dry powder inhaler during an acute asthma attack. And finally, digital inhalers are not recommended for routine use in people with asthma. In terms of self-management, we will offer a self-management personalized action plan. In adults, they may be based on symptoms or peak flow or both. However, symptom-based plans are usually preferred for children. We should consider an action plan even in children under 5 with suspected asthma. We will review the content of the personalised action plan at every asthma-related consultation. And we will include in the personalised action plan approaches for minimising exposure to air pollution and any other personal triggers. There are separate NICE guidelines in this respect on air pollution and indoor air quality at home and links to them are in the episode description. For those aged 17 and over who are using an inhaled corticosteroid in a single inhaler, we will offer an increased dose of inhaled corticosteroid for seven days within a self-management plan program when asthma control deteriorates. We will clearly outline in the action plan how and when to do this and what to do if symptoms do not improve, including advice on contacting a healthcare professional if necessary. When increasing the inhaled corticosteroid treatment, we will consider quadrupling the regular inhaled corticosteroid dose, but we will not exceed the maximum licensed daily dose. We will also try to identify at-risk patients. People who are at risk of poor outcomes include those with non-adherence to treatment, overuse of sub inhalers, that is more than two inhalers per year, two or more courses of oral corticosteroids per year, two or more visits to an emergency department for asthma a year, and any hospital admission for asthma. Let's now look at specific recommendations for certain groups of patients. And in pregnant women, we should make sure that asthma is reviewed during early pregnancy and in the postpartum period, offering smoke and cessation support if necessary. During pregnancy, we will recommend the normal use of SABAs, inhaled corticosteroids and oral theophylines. If oral corticosteroids during pregnancy are needed to treat exacerbations, we will explain that the benefits of treatment outweigh the risks. Also, if leukotriene receptor antagonists 
or long-acting muscarinic receptor antagonists or llamas are needed to achieve asthma control, they should not be stopped during pregnancy. And we will prescribe medicines as normal during breastfeeding in line with recommendations in the BNF. When managing asthma in adolescents, we will ask about factors that may affect their inhaler use in real life, such as school and social situations. We will also ask about vaping and smoking and offer support to stop if necessary. Additionally, we will discuss transitioning to adult services and future career choices, highlighting occupations that might increase susceptibility to work-related asthma symptoms. And let's end this episode by touching on organisation and delivery of care. In primary care, people with asthma should be reviewed at least annually and after any exacerbation, and the review should incorporate a written personalised action plan. And we will take into account strategies such as, for example, structured protocols for asthma reviews, mailing or emailing educational resources, and telephone calls to provide support. So that is it, a review of asthma monitoring, general principles of treatment and management in special groups. We have come to the end of this episode. Remember that this is not medical advice, but only my summary and my interpretation of the guidelines. You must always use your clinical judgment. Thank you for watching and goodbye.